name is Linda Levy, and I'm the director of the JDC Archives, and I'd like to welcome you to this program today. This is actually the first of the JDC Archives public programs that we're holding in our new headquarters. Um, so uh, we are holding today this program in the context of the Ruth and David Musher JDC Archives Fellowship Program. This fellowship was established with a generous gift from Ruth and David Musher, who are here with us today, um, supporters of JDC, who have deep roots in the American Jewish community, as well as a long commitment to Jewish education and ac academic research and scholarship. The goal of the fellowship is to enable scholars engaged in graduate level, postdoctoral, or independent research to conduct research in the JDC archives, and the JDC archives has centers both in New York and in Jerusalem. This is our third Ruth and David Musher JDC archives public program, and again, I want to thank Ruth and David um, for their generosity in endowing the fellowship. The JDC Archives, which houses the records of the JDC since its founding in 1914, over 100 years ago, is one of the most important repositories of modern Jewish history. Visiting scholars from around the world utilize our unique offerings for their research, as do publishers, filmmakers, family researchers and genealogists, and, uh, and curators of museum uh, exhibitions and others. I invite you to visit our website at archives.jdc.org and to see the online exhibits, to peruse our photo collections, to use our names index, and to research in our on online text collections. Um, we have over three million pages of our text collections available for the public online. Our speaker today, Professor Dennis Kozlov, is the recipient of this fellowship for 2017, actually. Our format is that the guest speaker will speak first, and after that, we will have a Q&A uh, session for about 15 minutes. I'd like to call on Ruth Musher, to, who's going to be introducing the speaker. Thank you. Kozlov is an associate professor of Russian history at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. His research focuses on the cultural, intellectual, and social history of the Soviet Union during the post-Stalin decades. Among his publications is the monograph, The Readers of Novi Mir, Coming to Terms with the Stalinist Past, Harvard University Press, 2013 and a collection of articles, The Thaw, Soviet Society and Culture During the 1950s and 60s, the University of Toronto Press, 2013, and a paperback edition in 2014. Dr. Kozlov has held research fellowships at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, the Davis Center for Russia and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and other organizations. His current research, sponsored by the Ruth and David Musher Fellow JDC Archives Fellowship, examines the cultural history of migrations from the Soviet Union to the West during the 1970s and 80s. It is my honor and pleasure to invite Dr. Kozlov to the podium to give his presentation. Well, um, let me begin by uh, thanking the JDC archives, and in particular with David Musher, for the generous support of my research, for which I'm deeply grateful. Um, the evidence that I have gathered here and in other archives is so vast, obviously, that I was able to um, incorporate uh, only a minor part of it in today's paper. And yet, hopefully, the paper will give you at least some idea of my work. So, the research project overall is um, a book, um, eventually, on the history of migration from the Soviet Union to the West during these decades, the 1970s and 1980s 
uh, between 1971 and 1989, um, no fewer than 360,000 ex-Soviet people, most of them Jewish, uh, moved to Western countries. And with these, about half came to Israel, while the rest ended up U.S. and Canada, in Australia, in New Zealand, or uh, elsewhere. Uh, this population movement is often referred to as uh, the third wave of 20th century uh, Russian immigration, following the first wave of the turn of the century uh, revolutionary era, and the second wave of the Second World War and of the early post war years. The book has two major goals. Uh, one is to write a detailed, archivally based history of this exodus. I explore the politics and human experiences of leaving the Soviet Union, the pathways between exiting the Soviet Union and reaching ultimate Western destinations, and finally issues of adjustment and acculturation as uh, the newcomers sought to make the West their home. My other goal is conceptual, and it is to examine the problem of freedom in the context of this um, uh, transnational migration. Freedom, uh, the notion of freedom, was central to the densely politicized rhetoric that um, surrounded this population movement. Um, and yet, what exactly did freedom mean for the migrants themselves? And how does freedom apply to an individual at different stages of a migration, be it the departure, be it physical passage, or be it accommodation in the new country of residence? So what you will hear today um, are excerpts from the middle part of the central crisis uh, that deals with the experiences of passage. Uh, that is a uh, stage after these people had left the Soviet Union, but before they reached and settled in their final destinations. Um, now I want to describe a few elements of this passage to you and discuss a few problems that these ex-Soviet, freshly ex-Soviet people and the organizations that facilitated their movement faced along the way uh, chronologically, I will focus on the 1970s with the understanding that uh, many, although not all, of the same issues persisted in the 1980s. What makes giving this talk especially valuable to me is that many people in this audience are eyewitnesses of that migration, because what you will hear today is very much a work in progress. I will be grateful for your comments, I will be grateful for possibly for sharing your own memories with me. Of our audience. So, with these aims in mind, let us begin. On the 25th of February 1974, uh, Leonid Brandenburg wrote a long letter to his cousin in California. The letter ended on a desperate cry for help. Dear Nathan, wrote Brandenburg, I implore you to not leave us in this state. Save us from this misfortune. To whom else can we turn? I have lived through much in my years, and the present situation that we are going through is frightening and tragic. Do everything possible and impossible. Save us. The 50-year-old Brandenburg wrote this letter from Rome, Italy, or more specifically from the suburb of Ostia, uh, located on the coast of the Tyrrhenian Sea. For him, unlike for many local Italians, uh, this seaside neighborhood offered no prospect of a pleasant vacation. Uh, Brandenburg was living in Austria temporarily while struggling to get U.S. entry visas for himself and his family. Uh, by a set of international agreements and a network of government and voluntary agencies, two cities in Europe, Vienna in um, Austria and Rome in Italy, became the main gateways to the uh, West for the third wave. Uh, meanwhile, its original destination had been not North America or Australia or place in Europe, but Israel. Uh, the official purpose of this migration was to allow Soviet Jews to reunite with their family members in Israel. And that was an invitation uh, from those family members constituted the formal ground upon which the Soviet government agreed reluctantly to let people out of the country. Uh, however, because in 1967 Soviet-Israeli diplomatic relations um, had been severed, uh, for most migrants the physical path to Israel was not direct, but laid through Western Europe uh, with a stopover in Vienna. The Dutch embassy in Moscow represented Israeli interests in the Soviet Union, issuing Israeli entry visas and arranging for Austrian transit visas uh, to be issued to those who had received permissions to leave the USSR. Let um, me go to this map here. 
And um, this is a map of Europe during um, the Cold War, divided Europe. And on this map, you see the principal route of this migration. Not the only route, there are many other routes, but the principal route. Um, people reached Vienna usually by train uh, at the time. Uh, they left the Soviet territory at the border station of Chok in Transcarpathian Ukraine. Let's see if I can point out. Uh, let's see. All right, so here you can see uh, Chomp. Um, and then having traveled via Czechoslovakia across the Czechoslovak Austrian border at the village of Marchev, here you see it right here, um, approximately, um, which therefore appeared on uh, the Austrian border control stamps in their papers as the actual physical point of entry. To the West. Uh, papers does not mean a passport. Before leaving, most people were normally deprived of Soviet citizenship, with passports taken away from them, and thus were officially stateless. Uh, for the time being, their only document was a sheet of paper that constituted the Soviet exit visa, with the Israeli entry visa and the Austrian uh, three month transit visa stamps attached to it on a slip of paper. Move to the next image, you will actually see a Soviet exit visa. This is the front side. This one is from 1976. Um, and then this here is the back side. You can see the photograph, and you can see two visa stamps. One of them is the Israeli um, uh, visa issued by the Dutch embassy in Moscow. And the smaller stamp on the right is the Austrian transit visa. If you look close enough, you will see the square or rectangular stamp with the name Marchev on it, which is the border station where the crossing of, um, actually happened. Um, the organization that uh, managed the Soviet-Israeli migration flow was the Jewish Agency for Israel. Representatives of the agency met the migrants at the Austrian border, took a brief train ride with them from Marchev to Vienna, and were the first ones to enter them. A few days later, the agency sent those who so wished from Vienna to Israel by air. Um, however, it soon became clear that not everyone did wish to take this path. Once they got to Vienna, increasingly many ex-Soviet people declared uh, their preference not to go to Israel, but instead wanted to immigrate elsewhere, mostly to the US, but often also Canada, or Australia, or other Western countries. Uh, this declaration usually happened during the very first interview stage of the Vienna Office of the Jewish Agency, in Israel, as well as among international relief organizations, this um, phenomenon became labeled by the term Neshera, or dropping out, uh, while individuals who did so were referred to as Moshim, literally dropouts. Uh, Neshera was on the rise, more or less consistently, for the duration of the third wave, uh, so far as the option of dropping out remained available. From a paltry 58 individuals in 1971, <coughs> By the end of 1989, it had grown to consume more than 50% of all Jewish immigration from the USSR. And of course, Western and Israeli intellectuals and policy makers intensely debated the origins of this dropping out phenomenon, and to some extent, the discussion continues to this day. At the time, in Vienna, uh, once the ex Soviets declared uh, their choice, um, not to go to Israel, the Jewish agency would hand them over to two other agencies, Hayes and the JDC. Um, Hayes would play the primary role in the migrants' further trajectories, as it opened their individual cases and applied on their behalf to various Western consulates for immigrant visas. Visa processing took place in Italy, in Rome, to which, after a few days in Vienna, the ex Soviets were transported. Go back to map, you can see the continuation of this route. Uh, the trans migrants, as they were called in the paperwork, uh, were moved from Vienna to Rome by train. Uh, four such trains departed every week. Each of them carried 170 Soviet people in the last three cars on a train. Uh, during the entire journey, the cars were locked. The travel took one day, crossing the Austrian-Italian border at the small Alpine station of Carvizio, Province of Free Living at the Julie. Closely enough, you will see Tarvisio approximately here. 
Um, being stateless, the ex-Soviets did not have an Italian visa specifying their duration of stay in Italy, but instead were moved on a tacit agreement with the Italian government that dated back to the immediate post-World War II years, actually, and thousands of people at that time called DPs were crossing the border. Interestingly, the train did not go all the way to Rome. Um, what happened that was that about 60 kilometers ahead of the Italian capital, at the railway station of Orte, uh, right here, um, uh, the train stopped, and um, the last three cars carrying the ex-Soviet people were detached from the remainder of the train. Uh, designated highest officials would meet there at the station and then usher them into buses, and then the buses would transport everyone to Rome. Uh, this arrangement was undertaken for security reasons. Uh, the large-scale movement of Soviet Jews via Western Europe inevitably drew the attention of international terrorism, and there had been attacks on the migrants in the 70s, as well as several attack threats. Uh, part of the story I have to admit for reasons of time and space, but I'll be happy to uh, tell you more during the question and answer period. Uh, in Rome, for an individual migrant, the Italian stage could last for weeks and often months. Uh, these are processing times vary from consulate to consulate. On average, it took, uh, or was supposed to take, six weeks for the US, uh, and then three and a half months for Canada. Canada was considerably more time consuming, and Australia actually took the longest time, four to five months of visa processing, if everything went well. It could go significantly longer than that. Uh, because people had to spend all this time in Italy, uh, little colonies of stateless ex-Soviets mushroomed in and around Rome. At the end of the 1970s, uh, these colonies experienced a crisis of overpopulation. And it is this crisis that I want to discuss in some detail today, because in many ways the crisis was representative of the problems the Soviets experienced in Italy um, throughout the Third Wave. So the year is 1979. 1979 marked the highest peak of Soviet Jewish emigration up to that point. As of April of that year, over 4,000 individuals were leaving the Soviet Union every month. Uh, from January through April, 16,274 people came to Vienna, more than twice as many as over the same period in 1978. Uh, in Vienna, anywhere from 62% to 70% of them and declared the intention uh, uh, to go to the West rather than Israel, and after a brief layover arrived in Rome in the fashion I have just described. Um, at this rapidly increasing rate of arrivals, uh, the thousands of incoming migrants began to exceed the capacity of Hyas um, and the Western consulates in Rome <coughs> to process their visa applications. A growing backlog of cases emerged, with people awaiting visas for months and months. And um, by the 20th of April, 1979, Italy had accumulated the record number of 10,251 ex-Soviet persons. All these thousands of people had to live somewhere, eat something, and receive basic medical care in cases of need. And it was this care and maintenance that became the primary responsibility of um, the joint. While highest worked on visa arrangements and subsequent resettlement, uh, the JDC office in Rome, uh, and the two actually were in the same building in Rome, uh, the highest office and the JDC office, uh, took care of people's material needs in Italy, providing financial allowances, initial housing, health care, and a few educational and cultural activities. Um, all these thousands of people, uh, having reached Rome after a two-hour bus trip, were placed in the so-called pensioni, uh, or basic level boarding house accommodations. The regular stay at the Pensione um, in Rome was uh, 14 days. Uh, this time was used for interviews and for the preparation of necessary paperwork at uh, highest and JDC with the caseworkers. And also during those days, people were supposed to find and rent apartments for uh, the rest of their Italian sojourn, and to that end, they were paid monthly allowances and were equipped with an Italian Russian dictionary because usually none of them spoke any Italian. Those cases happened, but they were very, very rare. Um, here in lay the second problem, uh, besides the long visa process. The allowances were painfully small. As of 1979, 
the head of a household received 150,000 Italian years per month, with each additional family member receiving 75,000 years. These numbers sound very impressive, but these are years. And actually, this was very little money, because with the exchange rate of about 806 euros for one US dollar, 150,000 years equaled 186 dollars for a month of living. So this was actually very little, even for 1979. Um, in fact, the JDC financial assistance to Soviet migrants in Italy was more than twice as low as the assistance provided by the Italian government uh, to other groups of refugees uh, who were in its own care. As Akiva Kahan, at the head of the JDC regional office for Europe and North Africa, and thus the senior administrator overseeing the Italian operation, acknowledged uh, our average daily assistance for a family oscillates between 3,000 and 3,500 euros per day at a time when the Italian authorities give to refugees under their assistance 8,500 euros a day. Now, 3,500 euros a day is slightly over 4 US dollars. Um, so for a family, uh, a family living on about $4 a day had to rent an apartment, buy food and other basic items, and stay like that for a few weeks, or likely months. It was no wonder that informed officials described the situation as living on bread, potatoes, and onions. Apartments in Rome were expensive, of course, mm, they still are, and most people looked in the suburbs for housing. Uh, the great line of information had it that a large resource of cheaper housing was available on the seashore, particularly off-season when vacationers were not present. Uh, and so it happened that thousands of Soviet people began to populate the seaside periphery of Rome. Uh, there were two places that they favored, uh, Ostia and Ladispoli, two Italian place names that have become immortalized in the folklore and literature of late 20th century Russian immigration. <laughs> so here you see the Roman metropolitan area and the two places, Westry in the south and the Eastry in the north, circled in red, and then the huge city of Rome right nearby. Uh, the two places were actually very different. Uh, Ostia, or more properly, Yudoti Ostia, uh, was much larger, with a resident population of about 100,000, and that would grow up to a million during the summer season. Technically, Ostia was not a separate city, but a so-called district number 13, Cecospizio on the Pedici, of Rome. Uh, La Dispari, on the other hand, uh, was a separate city, and a much smaller one. That a separate municipality, or as it's called in Italy, a comune. Its population, as of 1979, numbered about 11,000. Despite that, Ladispoli housed a similar, often greater people, uh, number of, of uh, Soviet people compared to Ostia. By the end of April 1979, um, of the 10,251 Soviets in Italy, over 5,000 were living in Ladispoli, and then over 3,000 stayed in Ostia, uh, and its neighborhood, about 600 were in Rome proper. Well, again, uh, apartments there were expensive, that's why so few people were actually in Rome. Uh, and while the rest of them were uh, new arrivals still in the pensioni, in the boarding houses. Um, in smaller urban communities like the history, the newcomers were much more visible. 600 Russians in Rome uh, were a drop in the ocean. And even 3,000 in West year were still not too conspicuous. But for the history, a city of 11,000, the arrival of 5,000 Soviet people presented a major demographic challenge. Uh, in 1979, Akiva Kahan observed the following in Ladispoli. Uh, walking in the street at 11 a.m., uh, at a time when all Italians are at home or working, practically all the people in the streets have been only Russians. They completely dominated the town scene, including already three markets. Well, here's Ladispoli for you. Uh, these are my photographs, and they're all contemporary to uh, the events I'm talking about, obviously, uh, but the, the place um, is uh, uh, visible, and you can imagine what it is and was like. Um, so the markets, the markets that Kahana described, uh, they're quite worth mentioning because small-scale trade became a widespread means of survival for many Soviets stuck in Italy. Everything was for sale, cameras, watches, Compasses, binoculars, 
jewelry, various souvenirs, from postcards to the ubiquitous nesting dolls, the matryoshki, all found their way to the Istanbul markets in an effort to bring the seller a little extra cash and to enrich the meager diet of potatoes and onions. It was not uncommon for people to bring items for sale all the way uh, from the Soviet Union, as they suspected or knew from earlier migrants that tough times awaited them. Naturally, this kind of street peddling was completely illegal. Uh, the ex-Soviets did not have trade licenses, did not pay taxes, um, and at any rate, being stateless, they were prohibited from any kind of employment in Italy. And yet, in addition to peddling, some took jobs as car washers, garage and shop hands, waiters, carpenters, etc., etc. Transportation problems emerged as well. Aliscoli is located about 41 kilometers away from Rome. Here you can see the route from Aliscoli to Rome. And thousands of these people frequently traveled into the capital because they needed to um, go to the highest JDC offices, which were in Rome, not in Aliscoli at the moment. Um, placed a heavy burden on public transportation. Um, as buses were jam-packed with Soviet passengers from the outset of the ride, they frequently failed to stop at smaller villages. Uh, you can see some of them here in between the display and Rome. Um, and, uh, well, that left local commuters, local Italian commuters, stranded. On several occasions, the indignant locals would block the road and loudly protest. Moreover, being packed in money, the ex-Soviets often did not purchase tickets or even forged monthly passes. Um, authentic bus passes were borrowed by one person from another, a practice common in the Soviet Union, but illegal in Italy. Don't do that in Italy. Uh, to appease the Italians, the JDC actually rented two additional buses from a local entrepreneur specifically for the, uh, the Soviet people, but it is unclear whether that resolved the issue. Uh, the post office in Ladispoli presented yet another problem. Interestingly, the postal communication between those who had embarked on their Western Odyssey and their families and friends in the Soviet Union remained frequent and intense. And Italian postal employees despaired. Not only did they face long lines of customers speaking an incomprehensible language, but the addresses in Cyrillic, written on thousands of arriving and departing envelopes and parcels, uh, were unbeatable, and deliveries were constantly messed up. Uh, and housing, of course, remained an issue, and the biggest issue. Um, the massive population influx and high demand for residences um, in the display uh, drove the rents up significantly. Um, although each Soviet family usually had little money, uh, they were poor, the families were quick to join forces and rent apartments together, at times paying quite a hefty rent. Uh, their life was, of course, far from luxurious, because several families would live in such an apartment very tightly, side by side. And moreover, there was a bit of a revolving door system. While some people were departing Italy, going overseas, other newcomers inherited their places. So once the apartment uh, was rented to the Soviet migrants, it never went back to the market again. <coughs> um, and thus, in Italy of the 1970s, Soviet people recreated the paradigmatic housing phenomenon of their old country, the proverbial communal apartment. More alarming incidents began to occur, too. The local Italian authorities reported prostitution among ex-Soviet women, targeting Italian men in bars. Um, a few migrants engaged in extortion schemes, forcing valuables, usually gold and jewelry, uh, from their compatriots. Uh, there were instances of violence and even a couple of murders. How did the Italians react to this massive ex-Soviet presence? Uh, the sources present a contradictory picture. While some benefited, others grumbled. Uh, among the beneficiaries were obviously the local landlords uh, and hotel owners, who even asked the JDC to send more and more migrants because they made money. Um, a few shopkeepers may have worried about the illegal trade, but others profited from, um, from the new demand in consumer goods. Uh, grocers and bakers spoke with a lot of praise about the tax migrants, and many shopkeepers put out signs in Russian to attract new customers. Um, on the other hand, Italian vacationers were likely to travel, as their summer rentals became more expensive, if at all available. 
uh, the local passengers of overcrowded buses and the disoriented postal employees were obviously annoyed. And to be sure, given the massive unemployment in Italy at the time, both the unemployed and the trade unions did not appreciate new illicit competition on the job market. On balance, it looks like the Soviets and the Italians were on relatively peaceful terms with each other. However, there was a limit beyond which the amiability threatened to expire. And in 1979, that limit actually seemed fast approaching. Uh, graffiti on the walls told an alarming story. Just beside the local marketplace in Ladispoli, with its bustling trade in watches, cameras, and matryoshkas, there were tremendous graffiti on the walls that read, go home stinking Russians, but dirty Russians have a bath. This, by the way, did not seem to deter either the Soviet sellers or their Italian customers, who appeared to pay no attention. But one might wonder how long these would last. In last year, too, graffiti proliferated, such as a large inscription, we need the houses, Russians go away. The situation began to draw the attention of the Italian press, and in mid-March, the influential Roman newspaper, Il Messaggero, the most influential Roman newspaper, in fact, reproduced the graffiti, you can see that article here, uh, while discussing the housing tensions between the Russians and the locals. Um, and indeed, well, the inscription here does say the Constitution of the Rus, in other words, well, we need the houses, Russians, away. Um, the JDC was quick to note that the graffiti had a general xenophobic rather than a specifically anti Semitic character. And indeed, a Jewish identity of the ex Soviets did not seem to register with most Italians, who usually referred to these people as Russians. However, with the numbers of Russians growing and the economic problems intensifying, anti Semitism could be searched anytime. The same article, the same article in the Messaggero, uh, mentioned swastikas being painted on the walls, and Kahane, Akiva Kahane, reported um, on his visit to the Hispari in January and February 1979. I have seen many fascist and Nazi graffiti, including inscriptions in German, Hitler, swastikas, etc. Later in the same year, on the 21st of November 1979, two young men uh, left a threatening note on the doorstep of the highest office in Rome written in three languages with the main body in Italian, as you can see here, but opening with Nazi see high greeting in German and signed in English, four years, if you look close enough, you will see it. Uh, this um, handwritten note was unmistakably anti-Semitic, referring to Russian Jews as insects infesting the place, etc., etc. Uh, so the writing was on the wall, in this case literally, and it looked as if a violent outburst was only a matter of time. This was obviously the perception held by the Italian authorities, as at that point they did intervene. Over the course of 1979, progressively senior Italian officials, from the mayor of the Dispoli to very high ranking officers in the Ministry of the Interior, summoned the JDC and highest office directors in Rome to a series of meetings. The tone of the conversations gradually changed from pleasant to tense as the Italians described aspects of the crisis that I have described to you and demanded an explanation. Uh, to some extent, as the politically savvy American relief workers surmised in their backstage correspondence, uh, the government pressure might have been due to an upcoming Italian parliamentary election of June 1979, in which opposing parties could play the Russian card, blaming each other for the mismanagement of the Soviet migration flow. Um, in what was clearly a pre-election move in late April or early May 1979, the Christian Democrats of the Display, the local section of the Christian Democratic Party, spread leaflets in the town, accusing the municipal administration, which was at the time controlled by communists, interestingly, um, of using Russians as a cover-up for its own inefficiency. And as a cherry on, uh, on Sunday, there was also a new fascist party in Italy, uh, Giorgio Almirante's Movimento Sociale Italiano, which had a small following, but might have been responsible for some of this anti-Semitic uh, writing. Whoever was to blame, the problems were quite real. Above all, the Italian officials feared the possibility of mass demonstrations and violence, especially of anti-Semitic nature. The government underscored its commitment to hosting the Soviet migration flow, but it insisted on dispersing large concentrations of migrants, especially in small towns like Ladispoli. 
and it also wanted the JDC to raise the migrants' financial allowances. The crisis did prompt Hayes and the JDC to take a few urgent steps. Above all, in consultation with U.S. immigration at the Consulate of Rome, uh, the processing of visa paperwork was sped up, making it possible to send more people from Italy overseas and to do it faster. And gradually, the backlog began to subside. By October 1979, the number of exodus was down to 6,110, which is still substantial, but it's less than the 10,000 who had been there in April. Ultimately, though, the overpopulation crisis of 1979 may have been resolved not so much by these efforts as by the greater forces of politics that intervened at that moment. After the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in late December, uh, 1979, the USSR curtailed much of its Jewish immigration, which fell drastically during the early to mid 1980s. And consequently, fewer and fewer migrants were coming to Italy, and the overpopulation was no more. However, a few years later, uh, the Gorbachev government would reopen the exit door, and in the late 1980s, the statistics of people leaving the Soviet Union and going through Italy further to the West surpassed even the peak numbers of 1979. And accordingly, practically all the problems that I've described returned in full force. Thus, for many ex-Soviets, despite the novelty and the excitement of getting to the West for the first time, the Italian log of their migration uh, journey was quite arduous, and it often could be very long. However, for some of them, it turned out to be especially difficult. Soviet migrants in Italy were not a homogeneous mass of people with equal fortunes. On the contrary, their backgrounds, their material situation, their legal status, importantly, and consequently, trajectories and perceptions of migration vary greatly. The statistics of mainstream transmigrants, as they were called, uh, do not reveal the full picture of ex-Soviet presence in Italy of the 1970s. Sizable groups were left out of the protection and care of international relief agencies, and for that reason, did not become part of those statistics, instead being counted under different rubrics. For Leonid Brandenburg, whom I mentioned at the beginning of this paper, the journey became especially long and especially difficult. Unlike most of his compatriots, he did not relocate to Italy from the Soviet Union via Vienna. Instead, he came from Israel. For him, the move to Rome and the attempt to get a U.S. visa uh, was already a second emigration. Uh, let us turn to the story as he told it. Born in 1924 uh, into a Jewish family in the western part of the Soviet Union, uh, Brandenburg was drafted to the Red Army during the Second World War. He fought in this war to the end and returned home only to discover that his entire family had been wiped out, the expression that he used in his letter to describe the Holocaust. From that point on, he had to struggle in this life for his, uh, on his own. He met the challenge of building a career as a mechanic in plastics uh, and marrying a Russian woman, Vera Mikhailovna. The couple had two children, a son and a daughter, and settled in Soviet Azerbaijan, probably in Baku. In the early 1970s, when it became possible for Jews to emigrate from the Soviet Union to Israel, Brandenburg successfully applied for permission to do so and departed in 1972. His wife and daughter followed him, while his grown-up son chose to stay in the Soviet Union. Upon arrival in Israel, Brandenburg discovered two important matters. Uh, these are his own words, two important matters. First, by law, his wife, Vera Mikhailovna, was considered Russian, not Jewish. Consequently, his 15-year-old daughter, Natalia, would not be considered Jewish either. Because of that, as he wrote, I quote, their future life would be encumbered with great difficulties and privations. He did not specify the privations, but he was clearly furious in that letter. Apparently, his family was Jewish enough to be let out of the Soviet Union and allowed into Israel, but not enough to be granted for recognition in their new country residence. Even in Russian Kiro, there is no such absurdity. The second matter was unemployment in Israel. Good jobs were simply not available, as he wrote about it, and taken together these two factors, the nationality and the unemployment, forced the Brandenburgs to greatly consider leaving. What aided in their decision was uh, one positive discovery they made in Israel. All his life, Lenin Alexeyevich had searched for remnants of his family, destroyed in the Holocaust. From his late mother, he knew that long ago, part of the family had left for the United States. Once in Israel, he began searching actively, and he actually found them. 
It turned out that he had quite a few distant relatives living in the U.S., and cousins in California, in Detroit, and even in West Virginia. In 1973, he visited some of them, and while in Detroit, he was even promised a job in the Ford Motor Company. Uh, after a while, the Brandenburgs decided to leave Israel for the United States. Uh, we sold our few possessions, he wrote, and came to Rome. Now, they came to Rome because they had heard that there in Rome, public agencies, among them highest, were helping the visa processing of Soviet migrants uh, whom the U.S. government might consider refugees. But here, the real trouble awaited the family. None of the agencies would accept their papers. The 50-year-old mechanic and his family ended up stranded in Austria, in yet another foreign country whose language they did not speak, their meager financial resources quickly evaporating, health insurance absent, school for their daughter not available, and job prospects exactly nil, as they were not allowed to work in Italy. At some desperate moment, Yad Mikhailovna even considered returning to the Soviet Union. That, however, was not an option either. Uh, like most emigrants, the Brandenburgs had been deprived of Soviet citizenship, and the USSR would not accept them back. Their cousins in West Virginia did pull a few strings, and they even approached a district congressman who intervened on the Brandenburgs' behalf with Heights. The reply he got was very neutral, promising nothing. There was also an ominous notation penciled on the congressman's letter. Um, AR, evidently initials uh, indicating Andrew Binowitz, who was highest as director of U.S. operations, says it does not concern her, not our case. The Brandenburgs are not highest's case because they belonged to the particularly unfortunate group of Soviet people, those who had first moved to Israel but then decided to leave the country. The Israeli term for them was Yordim, literally those who go down, those who descend uh, from Yerida, descend the term denoting all immigration from Israel. Exhaustive statistics on the your team are lacking, because as opposed to the standard ex-Soviet dropouts in uh, who took the Vienna road route uh, in the care of highest and the JPC, the your team proceeded on their own and were frequently off the radars of international agencies. Available numbers in the archives range from several hundred people, 224 in 1972, 484 in 1973, and then a rather sizable 3,000 91 individuals between January and September 1974, which was quite comparable to the flow from Vienna to Rome. <coughs> uh, the Ardeen were in a far less advantageous position than the regular dropouts. Um, while the dropouts were officially stateless and thus eligible for refugee assistance, the Ardeen could not easily claim that. Once an individual had spent more than a year in Israel, by law, uh, she or he received an Israeli passport at that point, which disqualified him or her from applying for refugee status. And even many of those who had stayed in Israel for less than a year before leaving were still barred from highest assistance. Uh, they traveled with an Israeli laissez passe travel permit, hypothetically might have qualified as refugees. And initially, some of them did receive refugee assistance at Western consulates, including the U.S. consulate. However, in late August 1973, highest reluctantly agreed not to take any cases of your team in Europe, be they Israeli citizens or not. Starting the 9th of September 1973, highest support would be denied to all ex Soviets who decided to leave the country. Unfortunately, uh, the Brandenburgs did just that. Having spent more than a year in Israel, uh, they were passport carrying citizens and thus ineligible for refugee status. And uh, at any rate, their move to Italy happened after the September 19th. Um, cut off. Uh, the records are silent on how uh, exactly the story of his family ended, but at least here they had some friendly faces. Their cousins in West Virginia and uh, the congressman even interceding on their behalf. For most of the year team, there were no such friendly faces around. Worse yet, the previously friendly faces turned away. Brandenburg was absolutely flabbergasted to learn that none of the refugee aid agencies wanted to see him. It was puzzling to him why somebody would be first championed as a victim of the repressive Soviet regime, and then abandoned a few months later. The Brandenburg story is not an exception. Archives are full of dramas and tragedies of the Soviet regime. Unfortunate people who, unaware of constant shifts in policies, believe that those who helped them yesterday will help tomorrow. Left on their own, these people felt trapped in a bureaucratic machine, which to them looked unreasonable and cruel. 
Importantly, these unwanted migrants did not surrender, and often quite defiantly refused to submit to the new restrictive migration regime. Like Brandenburg, and more vigorously, they fought back. They used the methods of communication uh, with the authorities which they had known in their Soviet lives. They wrote angry letters, lots of them, individual and collective, uh, in single and multiple copies, addressed to relatives, governments, international agencies. Uh, in the letters, they voiced their indignation about what they saw as restriction of freedom in the West that had promised freedom to them. One of them in 1974 wrote, I broke my life once and don't want to become a homeless dog. Wrote in September 1974, Mikhail Hanani, uh, another ex Soviet who had made his way from Israel to Rome and found himself stranded. <coughs> Hanani disputed the policy of not aiding people as refugees on the basis of their length of stay in Israel and the possession of an Israeli passport. Before leaving Israel, he had repaid all his financial debts to the Jewish agency thus meeting the legal obligation imposed on the European. He had also served in the Israeli army, and moreover, it was precisely to pay his debt and complete his army service that he had to stay in the country for over a year. And he insisted the passport had been issued to him while he did not know the language well enough and was unaware of the migration restrictions date to citizenship. His situation in Italy must have been desperate indeed, because he mentioned hunger and threatened to commit suicide if help were not forthcoming. And occasionally, suicides did happen among uh, these migrants. Following a very common Soviet practice of the time, Hanani addressed his letter to multiple agencies. As he wrote, to, I'm preserving the official orthography of the letter, to director of highest in Rome, copy, to presidents of Jewish organizations in US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And he also wanted to write to the United Nations. It is not clear whether he knew the names and addresses of those organizations and those presidents. It was just that having multiple addressees made the letter look authoritative, as did the author's promise to appeal to the press uh, exactly as such tactics had worked back in the Soviet Union. But this was not the Soviet Union anymore, and Soviet devices of letter writing were of questionable value. As well, obviously, a different language was required. Hanami did not write well enough either in Hebrew or in English. Uh, and so, just as Brandenburg, he penned his letter in Russian. At least Brandenburg's West Virginia cousins had his letter properly uh, translated and typed on a decent typewriter. Uh, Hanani was less fortunate and um, evidently recruited an amateur who translated the letter into broken English, writing by hand. Just as crucially as the language issue, in order to be heard, one had to have the right person's ear at the right time. And here, unbeknownst to him, Hanani did touch a very sensitive nerve. That's probably why his letter survives in the archive. The new restrictions on ex-Soviet migrants were being actively disputed at high official levels. From the early 1970s until the late 1980s, government officials, voluntary agencies, academics, and journalists bitterly debated what became known as the freedom of choice question. Although Hayes had agreed to uphold the policy of preventing aid to the team, the idea of restricting people from going where they actually wanted to go um, annoyed it, just as it annoyed numerous Jewish intellectuals and public activists worldwide, especially in the US. Following the 1973 agreement, they continued to take exception to the new policy, loudly arguing that it diverted Soviet migrants away from the Jewish cause. The legality of the restrictions was also highly questionable, and finally, those restrictions were barely working. Hayes repeatedly pointed out that the rate of ex-Soviet out-migration from Israel did not decrease after the 1970 cut-off, but instead kept growing. The cut-off also created a logistical nightmare. Now that Hayes and the Jewish agents had shut their doors on them, over the course of 1974 and 1975, thousands of ex-Soviet Erdim became scattered all over Europe. London, Paris, Brussels, Frankfurt, Amsterdam, Athens, and of course Rome, turning up in unexpected places and begging at the doors of various agencies to be helped to move to a country that might accept them. The agencies had little way of keeping track of those people, and more importantly, they were not always able to help. And so, football from one door to another, lacking proper ways to speak and to be heard, hanging by the last thread of their material resources, several thousand people became hostages to a variety of visions, institutional interests, and frequently changing policies that accompany the 70s. 
to her grave. Many of these people ended up in the very same locations in Italy, populated by their ex-Soviet compatriots freshly out of Vienna. As both groups were a common presence in the streets of Ostia and the Dispoli, encounters between them influenced the trajectories of the third wave. While the Yordim went through the ordeal of immigration in some of its hardest and toughest forms, their experience both complicates and highlights the story of immigration from the Soviet Union. In conclusion, let me say a few words about freedom. How does freedom fit this Italian passage, which for most of uh, those ex-Soviet people became the first meaningful encounter with the West? Did the weeks or months spent in Italy prove a liberating experience for them? Important as the question is, it also sounds oddly redundant and out of place. What freedom the reader or listener is tempted to reply impatiently? And perhaps many of those ex-Soviets, had they been asked the question at the time, would have brushed it aside with annoyance too. Transients in a country whose language they did not speak. They were in overcrowded dwellings that often lacked hot water and other basic amenities, counting every penny, selling their few possessions on the local market in order to supplement the diet of onions and potatoes. Anxious to obtain it by no means guarantee entry visa to their country of choice, did they have the time or the opportunity to think about such a lofty philosophical category as freedom. Perhaps they did, because time was one thing they had on their hands. But archival evidence thus far does not reveal any highbrow conversations on freedom that these people might have had in the streets of Ostia and the East. What we see instead is an abundance of concern with basic survival. Freedom, if it was a priority for the time being, appeared to take a back seat. Does this mean that freedom was of no importance to these people? For one thing, having an idea of freedom was not something with which contemporary Western observers often credited yesterday's Soviets. For example, an advice manual for uh, social workers and volunteers produced in 1974 by the Jewish Family Services of Houston, Texas, and a title from Kiev to Cowboys, and I don't know why it's called to a K. Uh, a guide to the United States resettlement of Soviet Jewry uh, read, among other things, we know that the Russian refugee comes from a country with a philosophy of life and a standard of living that is different from ours. A great part of his adjustment to life in America will be in learning to live in a free society that prides itself on self-sufficiency and independence in all areas of life. End of quote. Uh, Joseph Edelman from Harris came up with similar ideas in his analysis, also dated 1974. He wrote, for almost 60 years, the closed society in which he, for some reason always a he, the Soviet person, found himself had structured a lifestyle marked by dependence upon Big Brother for housing, education, medical services, uh, employment, as well as the general outlook. While the state apparatus had provided these services, it had diminished the role of the individual in securing these social goods. And of course. Such paternalistic analysis, ornamented by Cold War imagery, may have originated not only in the predilection for reading George Orwell, uh, but also in the fact that the analysts rarely, if ever, cared to ask the Americans themselves what freedom meant to them. Surveys, when they did happen, there were quite a few surveys actually, usually focused on pragmatic issues of resettlement, but rarely went beyond that. And this paternalism was occasionally lamented even by the experienced staff of refugee aid agencies. On the 17th of April, 1979, Dr. Alexander Gornick, a longtime director of JDC's health department, who had worked with refugees since 1945, wrote a letter following his visit to Rome. He was deeply disturbed by the situation of the ex-Soviet people in Italy, and above all by what he viewed as an institutionalized condescension toward them. He wrote, they're called by a number of names, transmigrants, Yordim, Mashrim, SKPs, refugees, I do not know if it is by identifying them with those names that we are unconsciously denying their personality. We identify them rather by a function, like transmigrants. This subconscious fact, which could only appear as a problem of semantics, in some ways conditions all the attitude and the program implemented on behalf of the Jews from Russia in transit in Rome. In a number of ways it was expressed that our function really has to be limited to the processing for immigration. All the other aspects which such a group faces in leaving a country where they were born and lived for so many years, their anxiety, 
they face after having taken the decision to leave their country, the physical and mental stress of their trip, first to Vienna and then to Rome, the insecurity of their future, all these are aspects which in one way or another are not of our concern. End of quote. I must say that Gormick's senior colleagues, such as Akiva Kahane, did not agree with his interpretation. And yet it appears that Dr. Gornick noticed something important. With some exceptions, the staff that participated in the Italian operation may have been too overwhelmed by, indeed overwhelming, logistics, uh, to focus on the minds of the charges, and too reliant, therefore, on uh, the cliches of Cold War vintage. An important conceptual premise here, and a caveat, is not to look for heroes and villains. It would be simplistic to sentimentalize the ex-Soviets as noble and innocent victims, and it would be equally simplistic and incorrect to portray Western officials who dealt with the migrants as callous bureaucrats insensitive to human needs. On the contrary, many of those officials genuinely took the concerns of their charges to heart. The Western regimes of migration could be oppressive, but they were not meant to oppress. In fact, the system of international agencies that dealt with Soviet emigration officially had the opposite purpose purpose, giving these, uh, these people freedom. And yet, what might the system possibly have underestimated? It appears that in order to find ideas of freedom, one needs to look for them in the right places. Those could be not so much philosophical conversations as practices of behavior, ways in which people acted in numerous daily situations. This is particularly the case when one encounters instances of political behavior, such as public letter writing, to which the excellent people, of course, resorted only at moments of dire need. What we find in those letters is that their authors did care about freedom uh, and were prepared to defend freedom as they understood it and by the means to which they were accustomed. They followed the patterns of self-expression and communication known to them from their Soviet lives. Those patterns had often worked back in the Soviet Union, allowing individuals an opportunity to voice their concerns, to be heard, and to participate in society in ways meaningful to them. In other words, they exercise freedom. Transplanted into the new Western context, the old patterns no longer worked, necessarily, while new ones remained unknown. Whether those were just the initial pangs of acculturation, and whether the new patterns would be learned, remains a question. The problem of freedom, therefore, to conclude, is how to define freedom and to what extent freedom is possible in the context of a transnational migration. Impacted by the Cold War, freedom received unmistakably ideological interpretations on both sides of the Iron Curtain. Western and Soviet media defined their camps as realms of freedom, while portraying the opposite camp as unfree. A physical passage to the right camp was proclaimed a move to the free world. In this picture, liberation seemed unquestionably possible. Yet was it? On the Italian threshold of an unfamiliar world, freedom was often prone to be sacrificed to priorities of basic survival. And yet this does not mean that people fresh out of the Soviet Union had no idea or no interest in freedom. Rather than presume a universally correct definition of freedom, which the migrant somehow has to learn, it is more productive to regard freedom as a culturally specific phenomenon. The story of Soviet migrations to the West in the 1970s suggests Freedom is not an abstract definition, not a set of grandiloquent contextual pronouncements, but instead a range of human experiences. Freedom is a perception rooted in the individual and in the degree of her, his familiarity with the given environment. The yesterday's Soviet people in Italy, Brandenburg, Hanani, and others did not feel free, not because they had not properly memorized some textual definition of rights and obligations, but because such definitions would have been meaningless to them. They did have other ideas, however, and the two sets of ideas, Soviet and Western, were not always incompatible, as the freedom of choice debate reveals, for example. And yet, adjustment to the new cultural context would take decades. It is a question whether these immigrants would eventually perceive themselves as free individuals. And it is on this question mark that I would like to end. Is there a ray of hope? Following the logic of freedom as a cultural self-perception, Freedom will be far more likely to emerge, not in the first generation of ex-Soviet immigrants to the West, but rather among their children and grandchildren, who will grow up in the new world and imbibe its values from early on. If there is an optimistic note on which to end, the hope is exactly there. Thank you.
Thank you very, very much, Dr. Kozel, for that very clear picture that you painted for us of the Odyssey from the Soviet Union to, to the West um, and that interim period in Italy um, and the uh, challenges that you've drawn for us um, uh, that they went through at the time and that, they, uh, that their children inherited. Um, I'm sure that there are questions. Um, I'm happy to open the floor for questions. We have about uh, 15 minutes, and I'd like uh, to just state that we like questions and, and not statements. Um, so let's begin with, are there questions? Yes. How did the Vienna become the transit place, and was Bruno Kreisky and possibly his Jewish uh, blood at all involved? Absolutely. And, and did the Viennese and the Italian Jewish community at all interface with the Russian Jews coming through? Thank you, thank you. Uh, Kreisky, uh, the Chancellor of Austria, Bruno Kreisky, was the key person in, in facilitating this migration. He was the one to whom, yeah, thanks to whom Vienna became one of the centers of this operation. And for Kreisky, I did not focus on the Austrian part of the story, uh, for Kreisky it was a very challenging um, operation as well, because when I mentioned, for example, a terrorist uh, attack on 1973 in September, there was a terrorist attack by, uh, uh, by a few uh, Islamic terrorists on the Soviet uh, transmigrants at Marchev, and then Vienna and Kreisky had to deal with this crisis. Um, and he actually was able to resolve it uh, the way he resolved it was also debated at the time, but at least no one died. So yes, Kreisky was a key person. Um, and then the second part of the question... Was there any integration between the local Jewish communities and the Russians? Uh, there was, but little. Um, because the Jewish communities locally were quite small. Um, I know that Hayes and the JDC, especially the JDC, actively addressed the Jewish community in Rome. Um, and uh, tried to engage them in, in this operation. And they did a few things. For example, one of the cultural clubs um, that existed in Rome, uh, if I'm not mistaken, called Kadima, was an, um, an, um, a facility owned by the, the Jewish community in Rome, and it was uh, given over to uh, uh, the JDC uh, for conducting cultural and educational activities uh, among the Soviet Jews. So, in some way, to some extent, yes, the, the uh, Italian Jewish community is participating. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. My question is, uh, you mentioned the fact that uh, Russian-speaking Jews uh, had difficulties adjusting and they did not understand the, uh, the local laws or customs. Is there, was there any representative that spoke Russian when they were arriving? What was the situation with the language translation? Well, uh, the uh, staff of Hyas and JDC did have some Russian-speaking um, um, uh, workers there, but those were not always available, not at any moment uh, in these people's lives in Italy, and in most cases uh, they were uh, on their own. And then since this is Italy, uh, well, uh, you need to speak Italian, right? And uh, there's very little English speaking actually in Italy. Uh, nowadays more. No, oh. and um, well, they did not know in Italian. Uh, were there any Italian officials that dealt with them? Um, occasionally, but rarely. And usually, they dealt when there was a crisis already present. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Misha? Yes. Uh, obviously, that the Soviet Union in propaganda purposes. Wait, 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 wait. Oh. <laughs> obviously, uh, that the uh, Soviet Union, for propaganda purposes, used all these calamities in Rome, and often, for uh, beginning from end of 60s until the collapse of Soviet Union, articles appeared in Soviet press with juicy details, and so on and so on. Do you have any data? Because uh, some people um, gave interview to Soviet press. Uh, Soviet embassies and consulate organized press conferences. Uh, do you have any reasonable data? Because I feel that all these stories were very, very much exaggerated by Soviet press. 
Soviet press uh, provided, never provided numbers, um, simply, uh, m m m yes, more or less how many people really using this way return to Soviet Union. There were some returnees as well. Thank you for asking this question. It's actually a very interesting question. I am writing a separate piece on that. Uh, Oh, the question, the question was, as far as I understand, about those people who wanted to return to the Soviet Union and how the Soviet uh, propaganda agencies used that. And they certainly did, and you're right, and they're very happy when this happened, obviously. And they did exaggerate a lot. I can give you an example of the data I have. Uh, in Vienna, not in Rome, but in Vienna, uh, in the 70s, there was a small group of people uh, who wanted to go back to the Soviet Union who completely did not adjust to this uh, life in the West, abuse of which they, they had gotten, um, 100, maybe 150 people altogether, not too many. But they insisted on going back to the Soviet Union. And they were placed in a special, uh, well, we could say either hostel or boarding house by the name of Malzgasse uh, in Vienna, which was absolutely hideous. Um, it was a building about to be demolished. It did not have any facilities for survival at all. Uh, it was guarded by the Austrian police or even the military on the outside, so you could not get inside if you wanted to. Uh, but nonetheless, the Soviets, of course, heard about that and they sent a TV crew to Vienna, to that particular location, and they filmed something about it and they interviewed, I believe, some of these people, however they had found them. Um, and, of course, all of this was blown out of proportion. Yes, the Soviets used every opportunity to do it quite right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Um, I'd like to invite you to see some of our materials at the table in the back. Please sign up for our uh, newsletter list so that you will be able to hear about future programs such as this, uh, and see some of our literature, and visit us at our website at archives.adc.org. Thank you. Thank you for your speaker. Thank you.